Is that you, John? He's killing mice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, who's this? This is this is Tim. Uh, oh, hey, Tim. And, and, and uh, I'm Shelly. Yep. And I'm yep. Chantil. And Tom is so yep. shy, he's moved away from his microphone. Hi, John. <laughs> hey. But, Tim, I didn't understand what you were saying. Oh, we were just talking about how uh, uh, we have this 12-hour sprint of uh, of They Might Be Giants uh, every year, and uh, so much yeah. of it, uh, we actually have somebody that's been doing some analytics of the the, the playlist, and uh, an overwhelming uh, number of them are around two minutes long, which makes it tough for DJs that need bathroom breaks. <laughs> I, un- I understand. No, no, I, uh, that's, uh, it's... it's there's no, there's no, it's very hard to get to the bathroom. <laughs> but, um, you know, we just started, we just started uh, doing, posting things on TikTok. I saw that, yeah. And, mm. and like, I, I mean, literally yesterday or two days ago was the first TikTok things that we did. And we've evidently, I, I see, I didn't realize this was the case. You can't put more than a minute's worth of music on TikTok. And um, I mean, I am not a I'm not a legal scholar, but there's no such thing as fair use for something as fluffy as a social platform like TikTok. I mean, nobody's mm. gonna, no one could say it was news. So up until re- recently, fair use was 15 seconds, and it was only for news uh, use. That's right. Yeah. You know, information spreading information. Uh, so I don't know what the one minute long limit is about. I mean, it's to, to my way of thinking, the whole thing is like a copyright free for all. So why not just let it rip? Um, <laughs> Especially if you're but, like sharing your own music. Well, that's the other thing that's so weird. Is like it's like uh, thank you for protecting me from myself. You know, it's like <laughs> I'm, I'm the friggin' copyright holder of this damn thing. So it's like. <laughs> You know what's going on, but uh, any anyway, either e- e- anyway, yes, we're on uh, we're on t- TikTok as of as of uh, just a few days ago. And thank you and, for not uh, just being like a dance TikTok or something. Uh, they're actually really cool little TikToks because uh, um, I I, yeah, well, I jump on TikTok I mean, I, and of course they, they look great. On, I'm working on my moves. Yeah, <laughs> I got, yeah. I've noticed that all the modern TikTok dance moves are based around this kind of step, kind of clicking your heels together is the is the main part of it. And if you get good at that, like if you can kind of very systematically, continuously click your heels together, you can sort of move into those modern TikTok dance challenges. I got some long-term goals. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, uh, you know, before we get into the questions or anything, uh, I just want to applaud your athletic ability to recover from horrific car accidents and get out on the road in as quick a time as you have. Uh, kudos to oh, you. yeah. Because physical therapy you know, is not fun. I, you know, um, well, I did have good physical therapy, I, I have to say. Um, it's, you know, it's a little bit, uh, it might be a little bit early in the interview to, uh, you know, to get uh, philosophical, but um, as people might know, just... Just for people tuning into the radio, my name is John Flansburg. I'm yes. <laughs> part of the band They Might Be Giants, which is the uh, the band that is being played all day today. If if you haven't already tuned to another radio station, um, but uh, yeah, this summer I was uh, I was in an Uber that got hit by another car, and um, uh, it actually flipped our car sideways. And, you know, the fire department came out and, like, pulled us out the smashed window of the vehicle. And I learned the next day from a journalist that you can't say the word accident if you're in a, if you're a, a victim of a drunk driving uh, event because somehow the official, the official, me, the the meaning of the word accident is not is not appropriate, which I, I kind hmm. of get in a way. Although I I don't think that I mean I know the person was was drunk and was being reckless, but I, I don't think he was an assassin. So <laughs> 
some, somehow accident seems somehow appropriate. I mean, yeah, he wasn't, lack of intention. He, he was being wildly irresponsible, and and I hate the guy for what he did. But um, on some level, I do don't I don't take it. I don't think he was he wasn't out to get me. Mm-hmm. So there seems to be some somehow I do think of it as being somewhat accidental. But long story short, like. I I found the the um the the whole covid interval to be uh very um like it, it was just such a downer it was so, such a it was it, it just pulled so much energy out of like the world for me mm-hmm. and what was strange about actually being involved in you know what was essentially a near fatal car accident for me. I mean, I got I broke most of my ribs, half of those in multiple places and was in the hospital for a week at plus and I was, you know, bedridden for over a month and it just the whole thing was really the opposite of fun and um but it was actually really life affirming for me. I I I you know, I was really I, I felt like I really knew I wanted to be alive, and that was very clarifying. So it turned out okay. Oh, that's that's good. You can put that that spin on it because you know it could have been just something that, especially because it was the night after you played the first show, correct? Oh, I was coming home from the first yeah. show. Yeah, yeah. I was literally, yeah. Re- like regaling the driver with what what a total gas it was, and just you know, we were just laughing and laughing. It was such a it was such a happy it was such a happy night, and uh, it was it was just a, you know such a strange circumstance, and everything you know everything about it. I mean, my God, being in a hospital is. Uh, being in like a trauma center is like a this it's like 14 one act plays strung together like there's so there's so much stuff going on it was it was a very wild experience really outside of my life experience yeah i i've had a, a experience uh, a couple of years ago being in the hospital overnight it, but when you're in the hospital um you just realize like when you're reliant upon other people to help you uh, it just makes you kind of pause and put into perspective what's important, you know, and and, and yeah. being appreciative of every little thing, uh, which yeah. is which I think a lot more people could use that kind of uh, uh, time to reflect like that. Yeah. But not being in an want, accident to to to, to you want to write way. your mom a letter of apology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, we're just so glad that you're you're up and around. We saw you at the Fitzgerald Theater in St. Paul, and uh, you oh, were on man. fire. There Wasn't there was a, a there was a moment, question. John, where Shelley turned to me and she said, "Can you believe this guy?" was in an accident just a few months ago and he's up there and I'm like I completely forgot it because you were not moving around and playing like a guy that was just had multiple rib uh, fractures not that oh, long no, ago I know well it, it was it was a, a, a good rehab I mean I, I feel like you know I got a lot out of it that was such an interesting show <laughs> you know um, there's a kind of show and it, you know, sometimes it's a theater, sometimes it's a club. It, there, we used to play at this place. It was a horrible place in, in almost every way. But one thing that was very different about it and strange about it, the, there's this place in New York City called the Bottom Line, and it was all carpeted. So the second the applause stops, it's like oh. very quiet. Which for a performer, like you, kind of live for the rattling around <coughs> of of. You know, plates and and glasses and people shuffling and all that stuff is kind of makes you feel relaxed that like it's not too not too much focus is being put on you. <laughs> yeah, you had you and, had said something that that night and and it made me realize, oh wow, there's this entire uh, theater of people just riveted by. John F. tuning his guitar, <laughs> you know. Well, that, that's the thing. It's like it's just—it's a little bit. Of, it's just that little bit of extra, sort of unfamiliar extra pressure that makes doing a show in an acoustically sound 
theater, like where we're sitting down, that much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's just that much more intense, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Tim and I were in the front row, center. You were right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> really? You know, yeah. I didn't. I didn't see you guys, and I didn't see Bill Child, who also I think was in the front row. And he was like, at, the next day he sent me an email. It was like, it was like, sorry, we couldn't talk. And I was like, I'm always sorry that we can't talk, Bill. Like, Aww. you know. <laughs> and I was just like, it was like, I don't know what you're referring to, but. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's but, it's it's really spoiled yeah. spoiled me from seeing another show because I've never been two feet away from the performer like that, uh, and and it was just amazing. And, and I I thought and, you said you were getting a box. Well, well actually, yeah, the, Tom and I and a couple of our friends were up in the opera box with our KMSU t-shirts on. So each one had a K and one had M. And Tom and Chantilla had S U, so yes. they had KMSU spelled out with their t-shirts. Yep. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. Right. So, so, but you were in the. But you're saying, Shelley, you're saying you were in the front row. Yeah. Yep. Tim yep. and I were. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it was amazing, um, especially when like the horns would come up and just be right over over you, and yeah. they're just blasting. It, that was really super cool. Um, such a good oh, show. Oh, thank you. Right. Yeah. What? You know, we've. Uh, I feel like we finally graduated to incorporating the horns in a way that is I mean the horns always whenever they kind of came in it was always a very musically exciting part of the show but it didn't necessarily feel um, like completely well it didn't feel I guess it, it felt integrated but it didn't feel integral and I think now it's like the shape of the show there's there's a lot of horn songs yeah. in the show and I, I think it's it's really improved. It's just, it's just so, it's just so interesting to have that whole other texture. Yeah, it, it was incredible because I've seen you guys with uh, just a, a, a trumpet, but not the full on. And boy, ideal. Yeah. 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 It's it's a big, you know. I, I think we're we're gonna try to use the uh, the flashiness of the horns as a way to justify. Higher, higher ticket prices. For <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw, saw that you added what eighteen more dates to the tour today. Uh, yeah, uh, right. This this morning. This has been such a hectic. This has been the craziest day. We had we added sixteen shows this morning at ten in the morning, and you know, ho- you know, I, I don't think any of them have officially sold out yet. But you know, it's always it's just always a big deal to put shows on sale and and maybe. Maybe some of them will go on sale. Um, I mean, well, some of them will will sell out soon. Um, but uh, we, uh, you know, just that would be like a big enough day for me just um, <laughs> dealing with uh, social media and all the other stuff involved in just uh, you know promoting those shows. Um, and then this just happened. To, this thing happened to coincide with it. And then on top of all that I, I um, long ago sort of obliged myself to do this to do a, a little to do an article for Road and Track. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> no, yeah, Road and Track, the car um, magazine, a, a car magazine. Yeah. Um, our ma- our old manager Jamie, who's actually retired from rock man our, our he was he was our manager for so long he actually retired um, but he's <laughs> he's a, a car writer he writes for all these automobile magazines his name is Jamie Kitman he's actually in the world of car stuff he's he's kind of famous okay and uh he was writing an article about um Charles Thompson of the Pixies Cadillac that he has had forever and ever and ever. Charles drives around in like a nineteen early nineteen eighties Cadillac, uh, which is you know kind of his jam. And uh, he pitched me to. They, I guess they they had all these cars that they wanted to review the the stereo systems of. Oh wow! And and so I I basically just the reason I was late for this call I, I'm so sorry I apologize but it was like it was such an extra it was a, such a longer day than I was planning I I basically uh, you know spent like a half hour this this afternoon driving around listening to 
um, rock music at really loud volumes in a in a Rolls Royce. Oh my a Lord! Rolls Royce. Are you kidding me? How does a Rolls <laughs> Royce sound? That was just one of one of them. Uh, it, I, I have to say, uh, the, you know, there are four cars that are kind of in the article now, and uh, there was a Maybach, which is like a Mercedes Benz for people who are too rich to just settle on buying a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> So, the, so they they gave it a different name and made it more expensive, um, and then they have and then it was like an Acura, which I which I'm not sure I'm not sure what kind of car an Acura is. I guess it's a, some kind of Honda. It's also like it's the Maybach of Hondas. It's a fa- it's a fancy Honda. Okay. Um, a very a very fancy Honda, and um, and then the other one was oh the new the new Range Rover, which is. Like this, basically the size of a school bus, um, <laughs> and uh, they all are very fancy car, like very fancy cars. Um, I don't. This is not like I, I was not shopping, believe me. Um, but uh, but the Rolls Royce radio sounded really really good. The only, I mean, the only thing that's missing with the Rolls Royce is like the the cloak of invisibility. <laughs> that you're in a Rolls Royce. Yeah, yeah. Were, now, were you driving it, or was somebody driving you around? No, I asked, actually, I drafted, when Jamie, after Jamie got me the gig, I, I drafted him to do the driving, because it, it would be hard enough to, I mean, Focus, the, first yeah. of all, all these stereos and these cars, like, just, they're all different, and they're all totally counterintuitive I mean just trying to hook up a Bluetooth phone I felt <laughs> like I should have gotten a like a postdoctorate degree in Bluetooth <laughs> technology trying to get these damn phone this phone hooked up to all these cars because each one was totally different than the previous now, and I mean if you were doing a test did you play the same song on each system then I certainly did mm-hmm. I even had I even previewed all the songs that I was testing it with uh, in my studio to know to know what like, like what qualities they they had like I like for instance uh, the first song I tested the cars with was um, Rock Steady by Aretha Franklin which oh, is so good a, a really great a sounding sort of classic seventies you know r- r- you know, soul R and B song, but it also has like this crazy stereo image. Like you can like the there's like you know kungas on the left, and there's like uh, guitar on the right, and it's it's just a very stereo mix. Um, so I kind of like when I listened to it in my studio, I I took note of like the exceptional things about every song that I I did the testing with, and so when I kind of tested each car and scrolled through. Like, there's some really weird things about cars. A lot of car stereo systems are essentially mono, which is really annoying if you like listening to stereo music. Mm -hmm. Um, They're just set up that way. It's a very weird factory default. Um, Maybe because they just are are too sensitive to the fact that people are not sitting in the same place. Like, it's nobody sitting in the center. So maybe that's what it is. But there are other things that are weird about car stereos, like like um, a lot of times you can hear the kick drum, but you can't hear any of the bass, which is a like I mean that happened in a couple of these, and you're thinking like you paid two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a car and you can't hear the bass. Where's the bass? Mm. So you only listen to uh, the doors then, or? <laughs> 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 well, that would probably be a good choice. <laughs> um, uh, no, well, you know, yeah, the, everything. I mean, everything I had was pretty bass dependent. So when it was l- missing, it was kind of sad. Yeah. Well, what a but fun anyway, what a fun project. How are you guys doing? We're doing great. We're what hour is this that we're in? Ten. We're okay. We've been on the air for ten hours. Uh, playing so requests, all, giddy. it's we, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that is a fact. But it's been uh, nothing but requests ever since six a.m. So yeah. it's been very yeah. exciting. We have played one hundred and twenty-three songs, uh, and, and all requests. Yeah, great. Hey, hey, Tom. Oh, that's the, amazing. What's the album most requested off of at this point? Uh, is it Mink Car? Mink Car has the most requests. The so most far. requests, and then I want to say it's book. And Interesting. Maybe phone power. 
Yeah, I think phone power was right up you there. Guys, you guys know how to melt the heart of a grizzled rock musician. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, I, think, I think we mention this every year, and every year it's true, though. I mean, with, with a lot of bands that, that have uh, uh, been around for a few decades, uh, you know, with many of them, people tend to be like, play your old stuff. But with uh, you guys, when we have uh, this uh, radio marathon going on, we get just as many requests for all of your new stuff, sometimes even more yeah. than, than your older material. And, and it, it just speaks that's, to how strong it all is consistently. That is completely adorable. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you, yeah, do you feel I, like uh, answering some questions, John? Oh, I'm, oh, oh, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. We have a whole mess of well, them from listeners. Did you want to talk to him about oh. uh, the... You should. Oh, well, okay, so the, this is a thing that you posted on Instagram the other day, and I realized this is the kind of thing... Drunk, okay? I was it, drunk. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> this, is, this was like the most valid thing I think I've seen on social media in, in, in weeks. Um, and it's exactly the kind of thing where I think it would have bothered me and I would, would have only been annoyed on maybe a subconscious level until you pointed it out, but it's the kerning on the spine of the revolver super oh. deluxe thing. Oh my God. Well, I mean, I, I don't, I have to say, uh, that might've been the most okay boomer thing I've ever, <laughs> uh, sort of volunteered myself, you know, like sort of with the patina of, 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 uh, over concern for proper graphic design. Um, <laughs> I think I have I, I have proven that that you know I was an early Williamsburg Brooklyn inhabitant. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, this you know I'm actually looking at the revolver package right right now. It's right in front of me, right next to my record player here, and this this is the thing that's also um, befuddling. If you buy if you buy this, uh, you know, like when I first heard this was coming out, you know, all through the pandemic I just got more and more into the Beatles like a lot of people I guess and when they said they were coming out with this super collector's revolver set I thought well I'm just going to get the you know I'll get the all the records and whatever the fanciest one was cuz it's like life is short and I'll just need more joy in my life so I got it and then I'm looking at it and and what was really interesting is that the box was upside down and when it when it's upside down you can really see that the letter spacing it basically is the words revolve and then ver. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I don't know I guess it just comes out of the computer that way because it nobody would voluntarily set it to be that way. But then the weird thing is the book that comes to it, comes with it, that gap has been completely addressed and fixed. So I think that somebody else laid out the book. Somebody somebody who graduated with <laughs> honors. <laughs> yeah, it, it's also... Uh, the the spacing issue has is correct on the hype sticker, possibly the most disposable part of the entire package. So it, oh, right, it, it's right. weird that well, the, the part that you'll be staring at as it's filed in your record cabinet it's is wrong. is is yeah. the most one that's glitchy. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some funny choices. Like it's interesting. They you know they took off the Parlophone logo on the cover. Oh, I didn't even notice as, that. This as is, well. I'm going to go home and freak out. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you know, the, the the illustrated cover with all the, the, you know, kind of beautiful black and white photographs, collage work integrated with the, the line drawings of their hair and their profiles, um, you know, it's a very specific kind of look. And in the in the bottom, there was a big Parlophone logo that was really beautiful. It looks like a coin. And it gives it kind of this f- extra filigreed thing mm-hmm. that I always thought was kind of charming. And it's certainly archaic. I mean, the Parlophone logo looks like it was designed in, like, 1934. Mm-hmm. Um and they took it off, I think, because they thought it was somehow crass or it looked commercial or something, which is funny because it's sort of like taking like a 
I don't know. I mean, when you, when you see such an old-fashioned logo, it, it, you don't really think of it as advertising or branding. It just is like this anachronistic, I don't know. But anyway, yes, the revolver package has some small flaws, <laughs> and that is one of them. But don't return it because it's going out of print pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, oh, do you think so? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, just in time for that, uh, all the other big box sets that are coming out. Um, hey, speaking of which, are there any, because you guys have been reissuing a number of uh, albums on vinyl, uh, and, or on uh, colored vinyl, or uh, is it the Zeotrope uh, as well? Oh, yeah, we've done, we've done <clears throat> for two Apollo picture 18? discs. Yeah, we did a, a picture disc of Flood and a picture disc of Apollo 18, both of which have side twos that are uh, zootropic um, experiences. You, if you actually look at them with your phone, the frame rate on your phone's camera is calibrated to make these uh, these uh, little film strips that are on the picture disc be turned into animated sequences. Yeah, they're super cool. Uh, are yeah. there are there any more releases that you uh, have in, in mind for the future? Yes, there are. Um, the th- you know the thing about um, getting re- vinyl records pressed these days, th- there's an explosion in vinyl right now, and all the pressing plants are double booked, triple booked, mm-hmm. and um, uh, so the deliveries are always. We got to a point where we don't we don't ever try to even pre-sell them like. Which, you know, in the past was like a nice way to kind of hedge just the the, co- the upfront costs of how much, you know, has to go out to get these kind of in production. But um, the truth is, the, the record the record plants that make them are so late. You know, they'll say, oh, it'll it'll come in January, and it's like, it's July it's like, oh, <laughs> of the it's following coming. year. Yeah, yeah. So so, uh, but what are, what's in the works right now? We've got. Um, we've got vinyl of Long Tall Weekend oh. coming, coming. Yes. <laughs> um, and that's a very nice package. Um, the artist who drew the, those illustrations, uh, whose name is, I'm spacing out his name this second, um, but it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, what the hell was his name? He actually re- drew a lot of the images just because his style had changed and he was like oh. I feel like I could do a much better job now it's like oh, okay no problem that's cool and um uh so it has sort of new new versions of the original drawings um and it's a really nice design and that's happening and um the not uh let's see uh the spine is coming out on vinyl oh and um uh flood is coming out on green vinyl but that that's Mm -hmm. been reissued before but there's a new a new variant of it coming out on green vinyl sooner than later and there i think i'm not sure what else i mean basically the, our plan is as as much as we can get stuff uh, you know part of it is just finding teams of people who uh, are capable of doing the the graphic design stuff to get it I mean we we just completely exhaust graphic designers um, <laughs> with the amount of work that we have to do um, so there's just a lot there's a lot to reconstruct sure. um, but we uh, we will be doing the spine, and we will be and um, what else? There's some. There was some other thing that was on the docket, but there's basically like right now. There's there's three things that are that all the the parts are completed, and um, and are coming back and are basically in off to the presses. Awesome. So those will those will probably land sometime over the course of the next six months 
Well, that's fantastic. But, uh, since I got yeah. since I got is, Mink Car, I'm, I'm so happy for we, anything. We, say, I'm sorry. Say what? <laughs> since uh, since you guys put out Mink Car and I was begging you for so long, <laughs> I I just feel happy with whatever comes out because I'm one of those people I try to be the vinyl completist. So whatever you put out, I'm buying. Just to let you know. <laughs> oh, uh, John Henry. John Henry. Oh, would want oh to get great. Great. Going. Yeah. Fantastic. I, yeah. I mean, asbestos got the rights to do John Henry before and they did put it they did put it out but the actual the films they were working from seem, somehow seemed compromised so I think we're trying to figure out how to get um, like they were I think what they used was literally uh, the CD a CD cover blown up and mm-hmm. so it just didn't look that right mm-hmm. um, and that was sort of I mean that's the problem with all these things with, uh, you know, finding, like, Mink Carr never had, Mink Carr was never pressed on vinyl. Yeah. So we had to, you know, we had to find, you know, sort of create, uh, you know, blow up the artwork and create a, a way for it to work um, on on a square format rather than a sort of slightly rectangle format of the CD and all that jazz. So... There's there's stuff to be done, but you know ultimately everything everything will be on vinyl, and that's that's what we want to figure out how to do. And also we want to figure out a way to keep everything that's on vinyl uh, like available because we keep on putting things up for sale. And I mean, I'll just to be just to be candid. Like if we would make something and we'd print you know a thousand copies or two thousand copies five years ago, that would put you know we'd be in good stead with that for like the first couple of years of almost anything we pressed mm-hmm. um these days everything we it, it's like we will sell over a thousand copies of anything we put out right away oh so, that's great wow. mm-hmm. so the demand has completely shifted to you know i think you know our totals have kind of moved from like 2000 over the course of like a bunch of years to like 5000 per title and it and it it almost doesn't matter what title it is so it's it's uh the demand has really shifted up um and that's actually what's made it possible to kind of be more aggressive in terms of uh programming like more reissues is that the profitability is it, it's not just like it's not just a break even thing mm-hmm. you know because there's a, there's a, you know there's a bunch of stuff to do it you know it's like you got to pay the people oh yeah who are doing the artwork yeah. and you've got to also make parts for it which costs like you know over you know like a few thousand bucks and have sometimes it all mastered like, yeah sometimes you have to get it remastered you don't always have depending if it's a good mastering job or a more modern record you don't necessarily have to get it remastered but like like we didn't get Mink Car remastered because it was a very modern sounding record. Mm-hmm. But with long, like Long Tall Weekend, I mean, Long Tall Weekend is like, you know, was so haphazardly made. It was you know made in like five different studios, and I mean some of the stuff just the the sonics of it are like really like unacceptable <laughs> so 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 we uh yeah we uh had to hit the refresh button on that awesome well should we did you uh get a chance to see any of the questions that we we sent out or is it okay to just ask i don't need you? to see questions i okay. can hear hear questions with my Perfect. mind <laughs> Well, Chantil just raised her hand. Do you have a question, Chantil? I would love to know more about the Sapphire Bullets of Pure Love in reverse. The Sapphire Bullets of Pure Love? Yes. So That we, you've been doing in reverse at your shows. Spoiler yeah. for anybody oh, who hasn't oh, seen oh, live oh, shows. Oh, sorry. If you haven't it's seen a live show, see. earmuffs. Sorry. Uh, uh, the, um, is it a, is it a No, I think the digital phone dropped out for one second. I didn't quite hear everything you said. Um, but... Uh, Yes, we perform this a song. We're we're doing all these flood shows, and um, you know it's sort of like it, it's a bit of a it's a it's a bit of a challenge to be to have to do the same show over and over again. I mean, for us, 
we've always kind of changed the show up in a pretty regular way. Like if something feels a little bit stale, we'll just like shuttle it out of the show and and you know maybe bring it back when it feels new new again or fre- fresher again. So having to commit to to performing this this whole album kind of got us thinking about how we could uh, work uh, do something more creative with uh, some of the presentations and we had this idea like what would it be you know could we I mean this is something that we were just talking about at at a like a rehearsal like could we actually play a song backwards um, and you know effectively enough so that if you reverse the recording it would sound like the song. <laughs> and uh, I guess, like, the thought was it was possible, but let's figure out what song would really work the, the easiest. And I think we chose Sapphire Bullets of Pure Love because it was percussive. It doesn't have, like, it doesn't, like, it's, re- you know, if you were doing a song backwards that had, like, horn swells in it if it you know it went like my love boy like you'd have to perform it backwards like ow you know which is a really hard like yeah it's just it it would be a very hard thing to try to reproduce backwards but sapphire bullets of pure love is kind of sounds like you know percolator you know coffee bean (laughs) kind of music so I think the idea was it, that would be easy to reproduce, and in some ways, it might be. I mean, it sounds like the texture of the. So, so we play this song backwards in the show every night, and we record uh, the the crew will record it on video and and audio and reverse it, and then in between the sets, uh, we'll we'll you know they'll get it sorted out and they'll play the video of it reversed to the audience when we come back for the second set and um you know it's it it's pretty good you know the vo- the vocals like you know John and I are singing in harmony through the whole song and I think a lot of the words are, are relatively legible it's, oh yeah you know I mean we worked really you know I cannot tell you how long uh, I mean I have taken like probably a half dozen two hour car trips from where I have a place in Sullivan County to back to New York City where I've for an hour or more I'll just have the CD going around and around and around in the car of <laughs> to the backwards version <laughs> singing along to it singing along to the thing and it's just you know it's just a it's just sounds and uh uh but yeah, I think it's it's it, it you know it's <laughs> it's kind of more interesting than it is effective. Maybe I don't know. I can't imagine what it's like to see. It's it's um, fantastic. It, oh, because well, have you been doing it uh, in every show? Which one do you think has turned out the best so far? It seems like it just it kind of just gets a little bit tighter all the time. Yeah, it's a it's a little it's it's definitely a challenge. Um, and uh, you know, John, the thing about it also being a duet is that John and I have to kind of agree on all these very small, little blurry moments, or we kind of have the unlimited ability to uh, muck up, muck the thing up. <laughs> but um, but it, but it, 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 it's it's good. It, it's it's uh, I don't know. The other the other thing we've been talking about. At, and maybe I even mentioned this at the show uh, because because I'm, I'm I'm kind of mentioning it shows trying to kind of goad the band into doing it. <laughs> have you ever been listen? Have you ever listened to like a podcast and accidentally hit the point five button on the playback? Mm-hmm. Yes, I have. Because oh, yes. <laughs> I was listening to I think it might have been All Songs Considered or something, and they were playing a song and. I must have just jostled my phone and hit the the point five button, and it was. I remember it was. It was like a. It was like a hip hop song. It might have actually been a Jay Z song, which I'm not sure why they would be playing a Jay Z song, because they don't usually play such pop stuff. But it, I, I'm pretty sure it was Jay Z, and it was just at half speed, and I was like, 
man, Jay Z is really on to some amazing, <laughs> <laughs> amazing new sounds. Like, this is mm -hmm. the most confident music I've heard in a really long time. <laughs> and, and, you know, then sure enough, like, you know, after 10 seconds, like, the vocal came in and it was just like, <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh, wait, there's something wrong with my phone. <laughs> um, but, um, I think it would be fun to figure out a song to do at half speed. Oh, my goodness. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would encourage <laughs> any type of messing around with stuff. It's very fun as an audience member to you, see that. Oh, yeah, maybe I got a big kick oh, out of it. You know, it might be good to do at half speed would be to do minimum wage at half speed. Suddenly <laughs> oh. <laughs> a three-minute song. Make it a full uh, yeah, uh, minute and a half I mean, long. only like... Yeah, yeah. I mean, not to make it longer, but just like, you know, it wouldn't be insufferable. <laughs> do you, if you're relearning a song in reverse, do you discover anything about that song while you're going through that process? I mean, for me, I, I mean, everybody in the band has different challenges, but like for me, it was just like learning a completely new song. Uh, yeah. There was nothing about it that was familiar. There was nothing. And probably even harder because it's not like you can learn lyrics. You're learning songs. I mean, yeah, so. yeah. I mean, you know, you're just—it's just a string of tones. And to be perfectly honest, I, I often kind of forget that the beginning is the end and the end is the beginning when we're doing it. It's so disorienting. Wow. Like, and then you also had to think about choreography, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, because there was some choreography. There was some choreography, but you know, it was it was uh, it was like all all they might be giants choreography. It was it's it's always casual Fridays <laughs> in the uh, in the choreography department. Again, it goes back to those dances on TikTok where you click your heels. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe maybe not so much casual Fridays as a uh, as backwards day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have a a, a, a question f that uh, we got from uh, a, a little girl named Martha who's eight years old in Glasgow. She wants Aww. to know what you are hoping to get for Christmas this year, and she wants to know if you are good at giving gifts. Um, I think I'm pretty good at giving gifts. Um, I I'm I think I'm a good gift giver. I mean, I don't know if you get, do you get to judge yourself as a gift giver? Mm -hmm. I feel like there have been occasions when I've given thoughtful gifts um, that, you know, had practical, I gave John Linnell a clarinet once, and I think that was a good gift, because I don't think he really had a real clarinet, and I know he ended up getting a lot of use out of it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so that's like kind of like like a bigger kind of gift to give somebody. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I give I give I give a lot of people I know bottles of champagne for New Year's now. Oh, that's mm -hmm. fun. And that seems like that seems like an incredibly uh, thoughtful. I don't know if it's how thoughtful it is. It's just uh, it's uh, it, it makes it makes me feel like, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm living in old time Hollywood or something. <laughs> well, you know, I can see that. I think it's kind of thoughtful though, because it sounds like something you should do at New Year's. But I don't know a lot of people that do that. It's a nice it's, celebratory yeah. gesture for a new year. I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's. I feel like I'm sort of trying to like remind everybody around me that like this is the life we're living. You know, sure. like this is this is what we get. So let's celebrate, let's celebrate while we can. Well, did you want to do... We have to do a station ID quick because we're at the top of our yeah. hour. Well, it's just... Uh, this is the Maverick KMSU Mankato KMSK Austin. Oh, that's the, we're doing the quick one. Yep. Super quick. Um, do you want to ask a question? Uh, let's see. Well, we have a question here from uh, Isabella A. who asks, do you ever utilize analog recording equipment like reel-to-reels? Uh, and a secondary question, any plans on releasing the 1985 demos in some format? Uh, the first question, um, well, I, I, um, I work up songs when I'm writing songs. I'm always using uh, cassette recorders. I, I pretty much rely on cassette recorders as my, like, sort of memo pads. So I have my, my 
desk in my the the sort of the writing desk in my project studio you know has a bunch of little dictating machine type cassette recorders um I have used I have I have the original four track tape recorder that we recorded a, most of the 1985 demos on I still have it have it in my studio and it it's fully functional I've kept it uh in good repair um a lot of the tapes that I have are um fading away which is really mm frightening and and but maybe kind of inevitable but like tapes do not last forever and ever and it seems like tapes from the 80s uh they're kind of at the end of their life i'm i've I've actually been meaning to talk to people about whether i should bake them or do something um but i do on occasion use um reel to reel tape for different effects if like um if i need to use a pitch wheel a certain way i will record it onto um a, an open uh, reel to reel tape recorder and then and then pitch it with the pitch wheel uh, cuz it's a very different sound than anything you can get on uh on digital but um by and large i i sort of try to stick within the box just more out of efficiency than you know like like the you can there, there's an extraordinary amount of stuff that you can do you know digitally that is that is perfectly interesting and and acceptable and i mean it's not like it digital stuff can make crazy sounds pretty well too but it's just like if you're really thinking of some very specific kind of sped up or slowed down sound there's something there's something to be said for analog tape i love analog tape and um the uh the 85 uh uh demo tape um the the answer is uh we are working on it finding oh, oh. again finding um the source material for that is uh is harder than you'd think uh, also the uh, 85 demo tape was sort of like an ever evolving thing so there was no there's like there's kind of one final version that was the one that got reviewed in People magazine, and uh, that is the that is the master that we I think are going to be going with. Maybe you need to hire some uh, or not hire, but um, bring on some some people to help you digitize some of those cassettes so they're not lost. Oh oh no we we we've got we've got the material. It's, okay. Part of it is just also uh, getting just. Uh, mastering it in in a way that's going to be um that's going to sound like a finished recording sure, sure. i mean cause some because there's there's some paradoxical things about the 85 demo like uh some of the recordings are are basically the the preliminary versions of recordings that were on the first album and that we actually shined up considerably you know like like I mean, a lot of the kind of crazier songs that are on the first album were recorded, you know, John and I recorded at our, like, little, rehe- in the living room of the apartment we were living in on my four track, and when they were on the demo, they were just mixed, they were just mixed from the four track with no adornment, and they really sound like, a, they it's not just that they sound like a demo or that they sound humble, but they're also like half the, the volume of a regular professional recording. And oh, it's really sure. hard working with some, with kind of, with materials that were recorded in such a uh, uh, primitive way. It's, it's, sometimes it's really hard to get those things to just to be loud enough. Without just being just totally distorted, sure. Yeah. The, it's, yeah. It's just like there's. It's more like technical things. But you know. But I mean, I. It is my goal to get it into the world, and I, I definitely. I would like to see it happen. Well, we asked this question of John Linnell earlier, and it's prompted uh, his um, must-do project of having to write a book on music theory. Um, is there any question that you have never been asked that you'd like a chance to answer, or anything that you've? Uh, gone down a uh, a rabbit hole lately and you're encouraged to get obscure or silly with this question 
<laughs> this is from uh, a question I've been uh, waiting. Rose to A. Be. Wait, wait. So, so can you can you sum up the yeah. sum up the question? Is there a question that you've never been asked that you'd like a chance to answer? Which is basically if you have something that you would like to 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 chat about or any rabbit holes uh, Peyton wanted to know uh, as well. They're kind of they're kind of similar, but. Um, Anything that you well, look, that you're we, really okay, into so as we, of late? We, we got to back up just one second. So <laughs> John Linnell has been waiting for somebody to uh, to <clears throat> to ask him to write a book on music <laughs> theory. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I, I think it's something that he's really into lately, and nobody's. Uh, he said nobody's talking about it really, or or uh, it, he's not been able to find any info out there about it. But. Uh, John Linnell hasn't been able to find the information about music. Theory. No, uh, the the issue is no, that he, he feels like there's not a, a clear language for how to convey things uh, in in music. Um, he he brought up an example of uh, 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 eight days a week, uh, where the you've got the chorus and then and the, and these harmonies, but then the guitar chords are changing underneath, and it's like. The, the way that uh, a typical musical theory thing would be presented might be kind of technical or, or, or boring to most people, and I think it was more to make things interesting. Yeah, to invent a language to discuss some of these things that he's listened to in music, and uh, it... It, uh, you can go back and listen to it. You almost or ask him about it because it, it, he said nobody would ever want this and it just would be a boring book, but everybody has just been going on and on about he needs to write this book. <laughs> so, um, oh, oh, I see. Okay, now I understand. So people were animated by the idea of him sort of dedicating some time to like talking about it. I mean, it's interesting. Did you read... I've only read little bits of it uh, because I don't own the book, but um, I have I have held the book in my hands because it's because uh, I think I think it's at Pat Dillett Studio. But David Byrne wrote a book about music. Yes, yeah, I and have it, read that. It, it's it's very subjective, and I'm not sure there was. I have to say there were a lot of things in the book that. Um, uh, I mean, he says he says a lot of things with tremendous authority that I think I actually actively disagree with, mm -hmm. and and um, and it just sort of reminds you of like how subjective uh, you know any opinion about music can be. Like, so when you're talking about something like music theory, um, uh, you know, um, like what is you know what is effective? Um, like I'll, I mean, I'll give you an example of like something that music theorists talk about all the time. They talk about how variety uh, in a composition is the thing that drives the energy of the of the musical idea, and you'll you'll hear that over and over again. You'll you'll hear somebody saying like, oh, like. You know, just circling back to eight days a week, the Beatles reharmonizing the song, um, you know, singing the same melody but with different chords underneath, mm -hmm. um, is such a it you know brings this whole kind of extra dynamism to the the song that is subtle because the official like text of the song, like the official musical statement, which is the melody, doesn't change, but the underpinnings of it, like the architecture under it, is like shifting around, and that makes it more interesting. But the thing, and I think you could, you know, you hear that argument made, you know, by people who love jazz, people who love the popular songs, people who love the, you know, American standards, people who love the Beatles, people who love all, you know, anybody who has like fussy arrangements of their songs um, will inevitably say, this is what makes this composition so fascinating. But I think, you know, in the 20, from 1970 on, you could make a pretty good argument that relentless repetition is incredibly persuasive. Yep. <laughs> and, and, like, what is, what is so magical about, 
you know, listening to an Iggy and the Stooges record, like, why do people love this so much? It's because they're playing three chords over and over again the exact same way for seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> And it's and it's just like they couldn't even be bothered to think or try or or attempt to do anything else. <laughs> and and so so like I'm not and I'm not saying like so so just like as a so, sort of like somebody on the sidelines of this of both of those arguments, I think the thing is it's very easy to get kind of caught up in one thing or the other. But I think the truth is nobody's wrong. Like mm-hmm. you know, they're like. There's a lot of different ways to do good music, and it just the 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 only thing that really matters is that it ends up being it ends up being good. Well, and and this question wasn't even about music theory. Is there anything that you're kind of just into as of lately that you're dying to have somebody ask you a question about, so you can be like, oh, funny, you should say that kind of thing. Is there uh, anything that you've been, you know, I've. <laughs> A lot of my sort of, I think I think about I think about um, I think about history, and I think and I think about the present, the and I think about the way any present day thing is understood. Um, I've I've been listening to a couple of very historic uh, podcasts that are very unrelated to one another in certain ways, but they just happen to be taking place at around the same time. The Rachel Maddow podcast, the Ultra podcast, which is kind of fascinating. It's basically about um, uh, these these sort of Nazi sympathetic, Nazi sympathizers who sort of did, were trying to do this sort of seditious stuff right before the break outbreak of World War II. Or, uh, and, and uh, you know, it, it's really juicy history that's largely been forgotten. Um, I've also been listening to like some other like pre World War Two history stuff that um, is, uh, you know, talking about war profiteers. You know, I actually, you know, I, 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 I guess the the abstract, you know, when my head hits the pillow thing I've been pondering the most is what's the difference between living through something and reading the history of something and like sort of the big the sort of the the the, the, the macro differences um, just in terms of uh, like how well you can know a time and how well you can understand a vibe like I, like I think about how Trump will go down historically. Like I, I really wonder. I mean, there are things that I think are totally invisible to us now. Like there's no doubt in my mind that you know the if there's a two paragraphs about this the era we live in, you know the paragraph will start with you know Barack Obama was our first black president and that was a really, uh, you know, progressive moment. And Mm -hmm. then so many people were so upset by that, that this reactionary event happened where a guy who was essentially a scoundrel tried to, you know, claw back whatever progress had been made. And that's just how it's going to be. But it's like, how long will it take to get to there? You know, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we lived through that, but hey, guys, you know, a pledge time comes only once every. Uh, <laughs> <couple of months. laughs> oh, we just had our pledge drive. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Thank you. Right. You're listening to Nancy Pelosi Radio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's so do you manage yeah, to I'm get listening. to sleep after that kind of heavy thinking? <laughs> uh, sometimes I don't sleep so well. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know. But uh, I don't know. You know, this is also not the only t- tough times that, like, this co- we've been through as a country. That's that's the thing. That's the important thing to remember is that it's always the struggle continues. Well, and something that should have been really unifying 
like COVID, like because we're all going through it. There's, it's not a matter of your economic standing or, or uh, anything. Everybody is going through it, and it should have been really a time to unify, but it seemed to just divide. Sadly, um, and I think that'll be right. I, I think the whole what's going on with COVID is going to be stuff that people will really dive into <clears throat> in the future. Well, this, you know, th- just this circles back to something. Um, that uh, I was reading about, which is during World War II, in the beginning of World War II, there uh, there was all sorts of you know uh, public sacrifice, you know, like like uh, calls for um, rationing and mm-hmm. just general public sacrifice for, in, for the war effort. And the and the weird thing is. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people did not participate, and a lot of people thought it was too much and unnecessary. And it was kind of reminiscent of, um, you know, vaccine denier, not, not the scientific part, not the, not the, not the uh, sort of conspiracy theory part of it, but just the kind of grumpy Gus, I don't want to be part of this community activity, like... You know, there are these people, you know, regular regular folks are just saying, like, we've all got to pull together, we've all got to do this thing, we've all got to join and make a, a, a shared sacrifice. And there were, there were tons of people who were just like, this is just the government just controlling us, we don't have to do this, like, we should be able to use as much gasoline as we want, we should be able to, you know get just as much plastic stuff as we want. We should be able to, you know, there was like, everything was rationed. Yeah. And people hated it. They just hated it. And they just rejected, like, you know, like, like something, some crazy, the statistics are crazy. Like, they're saying, like, between, like, you know, 25 and, like, 35% of the population were just basically cheating on the rationing stuff. So it was like widely ignored. Like it wasn't just rich people; it was also like just people. So, uh, and you don't. That's anyway. not what you hear. You hear about how we all came together for the cause. Exactly. Exactly. And as soon as the war was over, like it was just completely swept under the rug that there were people who were dissenting from that. And there was it, it was there was plenty of public grumbling about it as well. I mean, it was it was not a secret. And a lot of people thought it was pointless, and a lot of people just thought it was un-American. It was just like, let, let us do what we want to do. Like, we you know, I mean, a lot, it was just an interesting divergence from from the way, the history that you hear. Mm-hmm. Well, you know... But anyway, let's... Let's get back to the, the back to the music, you guys. Re, 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 related to that, um, we had a question from Adam J. who says that uh, you and Linnell both seem to be very very positive people. What is the most important thing you do to maintain your positivity? Uh, that's it, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> I was thinking, I'll tell you this crazy story about my, my mom the other, that happened a couple of months back. But, uh, but uh, I think um, for me personally, like I'm just very curious about the world. I, I love, like I've never, uh, I, I just, I, I'm fascinated by, I'm fascinated by so many things in the world, um, you know, that are totally unrelated to like, you know our musical expression or whatever i mean it's just like i'm just i'm just into i'm fascinated by like the psychology of crowds i'm fascinated by uh social media i'm fascinated by everything mm-hmm. uh but i was going to set tell you this kooky story about my <laughs> i guess for a very long time i have said if i'm having a conversation with somebody about something that's kind of complicated, mm-hmm. I will interject and say, "It's going to be great." <laughs> <laughs> like, like almost like as a plea to like just like to just not overthink it. 
mm-hmm. and I was having a conversation with my mom, and she was she was worried about something, like you know, which like you know, moms worry about this or that, and I was like, oh, mom, I was like, mom, it's going to be great, <laughs> and I, you know, I I didn't I don't even think I don't even think about saying this, you know, but I guess it's like a thing I say, and uh, and my mother actually sort of called me out and was like, you always say it's going to be great. <laughs> and 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 I like I kind of didn't have a response and and I was like well I, you know and then we just kept on talking and and then afterwards I just thought is that is that such a bad <laughs> is that such a bad <laughs> quality to have to 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 try to reassure somebody that it's going to be great <laughs> not at all. <laughs> You know, I mean, and it was just very funny coming from my mom. I mean, my mom is also an extremely optimistic person. I mean, I, I think I kind of get it from my mom. My mom is really up. Um, but uh, I think she just, like, she just didn't want to be, she didn't want to be cheered up at that point, at that moment. And I think she was just annoyed with me and my and my optimistic <laughs> outlook. <laughs> She wanted to be down for a minute. <laughs> yeah, it's like, let, let, me, let me just be, let me just ponder how it's not going to be great for a second. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we'd love to ask you this question. Uh, any good books that you're reading? Did you, did you read a lot when you were down for a while? Or I, uh, was it I too did, hard to concentrate? I I've, you know, I've, well, I, you know, I've been listening to a lot. When I was in the hospital, I listened to a lot of, things on books on tape um which was like kind of like a great a great distraction Mm -hmm. let me go to my audible um i have to admit i've gotten used to listening to books on tape at like almost double speed which is a completely (laughs) psycho thing to do Mm -hmm. i didn't even know you Um, could do that (laughs) Yeah, if you put it at one point seven five, it, it it doesn't <laughs> seem quite so crazy. Um, uh, I just was listening to uh, uh, "Good Booty" by Ann Powers, which is a, a basically the history of sex and music. Um, I started listening to, but didn't finish Ten Days That Shook the World" by John Reed, which is like oh. about the Russian Revolution. That I think I need to actually kind of know more real history. Watch the movie about. Reds. <laughs> oh, it is kind of the movie Reds, right? Yep. Right. Yep. Um, I listened to uh, "Mrs. Dalloway" by Virginia Woolf, which was oh. uh, pretty great. Um, I listened to. Uh, Dave Van Ronk's uh, autobiography called The Mayor of McDougal Street. Dave Van Ronk was the guy who put together the guitar figure that is the house of... uh, uh, There is a house in New Orleans. House of the Rising Sun. What's that song called? House of the Rising Sun? Yeah. Um, The do-do-do-do-do. The arpeggiated guitar thing was his... That's not a traditional thing. That's like was invented fully by Dave Van Ronk mm. and then stolen by Bob Dylan on his first album before Dave Van Ronk got to make a recording of it and and thus was one of the the earliest kind of uh, real live music feuds of Greenwich Village. Um, I started listening to The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, but it was kind of a downer. <laughs> kind of a downer. It was also extremely long, and uh, but I actually think I'll get I think I'll get back to it. But uh, according to this, I have thirty five hours to go. Oh my so. gosh! Wow. That's a long um, car trip. Uh, I listened to uh, Here Is New York by E. B. White, which is a very uh, it's, it's essentially an article from the fifties, uh, but uh, that's kind of it's kind of archaic. It's a little bit. It's it's. Uh, it's I don't know. It's it's weird. It's it just seems like it's from another world. Uh, I listened to. Oh, this is a, a fascinating book. Allow me to retort by Ellie Mistal. Do you know who Ellie Mistal is? He's a he's a political. No. He's a, he's like a I think he's a college professor. I think he might be a professor of of a constitutional history, and 
or I'm not exactly. Oh, maybe not. I, he's he he thinks the Constitution should be rewritten, which is a, and it makes a very compelling argument for it. Um, and that was that was very cool. Uh, I list some of these. Some of these I kind of came back to because I just needed more things. Uh, pictures at a revolution by Mark Harris, who's the guy who wrote um, the really great biography of Mike Nichols. Actually, the biography of Mike Nichols... Oh, I've, is, I've, I've heard the yeah. author talking about that book. Was that good? It's amazing. Okay. It's really amazing. Um, I'm not sure if it is, if it's completely, if there isn't a lot of stuff... I mean, there are things about Mike Nichols that sh- were shocking. Like, Mike Nichols, at the age of, like, 57 became a crack addict. Well, I didn't know seemed, that. <laughs> huh. It's not like uh, it's not like anybody talked about it even when it was happening. It's like seems completely out of character and I don't think he did it forever, but like he totally tried crack and ended up like being on crack. Wow. Which is crazy. Wow. Hmm. Jeez. Yeah, one of those yeah. things like Charlie Watts not be- becoming a, a heroin addict in the '80s. After all the right. other Rolling Stones went through that, <laughs> right, right. It's just you're just like what, like mm-hmm. you. But you know, I think he was a uh, he was drug. He was he totally got a kick. Uh, he got a kick out of cocaine, you know. And I think he thought, oh, maybe this is just a more efficient way to use cocaine. <laughs> and and so he got kind of caught up in it, but uh, but that's not the only thing about the that book that's kind of a revelation. He's an, he was an, a really an interesting interesting person with a lot of uh, a lot of crazy ideas that are sort of worthwhile. I listened to um, Sticky Fingers, the biography of. Uh, uh, Jan Wenner, oh, the yeah. unauthorized biography of Jan Wenner. That was good. Um, England's Dreaming, the uh, punk, history of punk mm-hmm. rock, but maybe that was that was a while ago. So that's what so that's what comes up first on my Audible. Awesome. Well, you know what, John, we've been on the phone with you for over an hour now, and oh, you've had goodness. a long day, so I, I feel like we should cut it off for you so you can relax. <laughs> oh, I, I gotta, I, I gotta get back to work here. I got, I got oh. music to record. Oh. I gotta finish a song tonight. Oh my goodness! Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the, for being so generous with your time, John. Of course, uh, but always I gotta tell a joy you to talk to you. Of the song. Yeah, what's the, the title? The song. The title of the song is "You Heart Your Bad Attitude." <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot of truth in that title. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you so much. Hey, thank yeah, you. Thank you, and and good luck on the the big uh, extended tour now. And uh, feel free to swing by Minnesota again anytime soon. When you... oh, that would be a blast. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for all the interest and the support. It's you have no idea how it's very uh, the dream come true. Oh well, well thanks. Thank you, John. Thanks. Have a great evening. Yeah. Bye bye. Right, you guys. Bye bye. <laughs>